I am delighted now to introduce my colleague, Alex Bayan. Alex is the Chancellor's Professor and also the Director of the Institute for Transportation Studies, Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Berkeley. Um, his appointment at the university <coughs> is in civil and environmental en engineering, as well as um, EECS, electrical engineering and computer science. He's been director of ITS, Transportation Studies, since 2014. He's written a whole lot. He's gotten a lot of recognition for his work, and he's doing really fascinating work on transportation um, data and social networks in the Bay Area. Please join me in welcoming Alex. Well, I work in transportation, and uh, at first I want to say thank you to Anno for the warm introduction and for the uh, honor to speak here. So since we're ahead of schedule, thanks to this phenomenal organization, I'm going to tell one story that goes back to 1932 uh, with my grandfather, which has to do with transportation. So he had a colleague that used to travel from Paris to Munich by train um, every month or so. And uh, the train, inevitably, on the French Railroad, SNCF, would arrive to Strasbourg uh, late, because it's the French Railroad in 1932. <laughs> and uh, then he would cross the border with Germany at Kehl. And then the German conductor, the Schaffner, would come and then say, ladies and gentlemen, you're now on the Deutsche Reichsbahn. And, uh, because of the French railroad, uh, you're late, but uh, we're going to catch up with uh, uh, schedule. And by the time we come to Munich, we'll be ahead of schedule by a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> and they would. So now you're in charge uh, of the French person, so I hope I won't derail um, the beautiful schedule here, because we are running ahead of schedule. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk today about the infrastructure of traffic in the age of big data and social uh, networks. Uh, what's phenomenal is that the big revolution in traffic is not coming from traffic infrastructure, but coming from data that is mostly generated by things which have nothing to do um, with traffic. And that is completely changing the way infrastructure is operated uh, at the present age. Um, I think the main thing is, you know, vehicles are getting connected in all kinds of ways. Um, your phone, your car, your laptop is more or less going to run the same, same apps pretty soon. And whether it's through a dedicated uh, platform that runs on the car, like people are talking about uh, Android for vehicles or something like Miralink or any other paradigm, um, this is happening in the very near future. So whether it happens on legacy cars through the OBD2 or because it comes with your new car, doesn't really matter. Um, I think this curve here is probably the most phenomenal curve that has affected transportation, which has nothing to do with transportation. Uh, this was given to me by Jim Swar uh, from IBM. Um, the one thing you can probably see most here is the growth of uh, devices shipped uh, since basically the 70s. So like these very traditional products, you can look at uh, vintage devices like the Apple II, and uh, you can see the birth of RIM and Symbian. Um, and then you can probably see this curve, which is almost vertical, and now we're talking back 2010, 2011. So right now it's probably above the roof. Um, and that's the growth of the Android uh, fleet and uh, population of smartphones. This has completely changed the way traffic is done, and this was completely not anticipated by, by traffic. And so what I, want to say to, what I want to tell today is the story of this data, but most importantly, what that data um, means for transportation and, and who should own that data, how should that data um, be traded, and how do we create a market for it? And this is still a very open problem. So it's really not a technical talk. It's really a talk about, you know, what are the implications of science and data science onto how we create a market in the context of infrastructure. Um, what made a huge difference in the way this data can be ingested by people who do transportation is, of course, the cloud computing backend that can support it. In a sense, um, this data wouldn't be of use to transportation if there was not a lot of changes happening on the back end as well, and that's something that we will uh, discuss in this talk as well. Um, so one thing which, uh, I guess, to start with is um, the correlation of human activity and genesis of this data. Uh, this is a very basic picture of what a tessellation of cell phone providers would be uh, in the Bay Area. And for those of you who are natives from here or, or work here, I mean, obviously, the two major axes of transportation, which would be the 101 280 corridor and the 580 80 880 corridor on the other side of the Bay, are completely obviously correlated with the um, um, cell tower implantation uh, for most, most of the networks um, that work in the Bay. And obviously, uh, also correlated with the density of population. So what does it mean in terms of mobility? It means that a lot of this nomadic and crowdsourced data that is 
currently not so used by public agencies, but that they really heavily want to engage in, um, is being generated along these axes. This is going to be very important later when we come back to the genesis of markets, because these markets um, are usually born locally, and we have not seen yet an explosion of um, the market of trading crowdsourced data for traffic. And this is one of the big question marks of the coming 10 years. But if this ever happens, then this is the likely places where you will see it happening. Of course, the same on the East Coast and many other places in the world where you have uh, such data um, generated. Um, another aspect of this explosion is obviously the growth in the uh, user um, of a base of the social network. This is also a pretty um, obsolete curve, and, and, and uh, which has grown a lot uh, since. Um, and here, why does that matter to traffic? It does matter to traffic because if you look at the way traffic information is exchanged today, you have cases like, I don't know how many of you are taking the Caltrain, but today, if you want reliable traffic information on the Caltrain, um, it comes through Twitter. The Twitter feed that is um, associated with the Caltrain um, is the best way to get information. If you go to caltrain.com, you won't get as, um, as accurate information. So the notion that you could create traffic information and traffic control systems based on that data has become a reality because it is already influencing people in their mobility. And of course, it creates a lot of questions because of the ownership of these systems. Uh, obviously, these systems are operated by companies which are not the public sector. Um, but also because it influences the way um, uh, traffic is controlled in ways which might be external to the public sector, and that might be a problem. And we'll talk about this as well. Um, to give you an example, we worked a lot with Waze. I think most of the people in this community know Waze. Waze was the first social network that um, really embraced uh, traffic as its main priority. It was born in Israel um, as a result from the fact that maps in Israel are very dynamic because of the political situation. They change all the time. That affects traffic greatly. So it was born as a game where people were getting points in that system by being the first to drive on a certain road. That's how they built their map. And later on, um, created a lot of information for traffic in this very dynamic environment. It turns out that um, Waze um, uh, also can provide a lot of valuable input to um, the public sector in that it provides a lot of contextual information about traffic. Um, so this is an example of a data study we did for Waze for doing sentiment analysis a couple years back. Um, and he, each of the points here shows a posting um, of um, information that was done um, on Waze. And uh, with that, we associated a lot of the uh, content that was posted. Now, we edited this because there's a lot of words that come often when you're stuck in traffic that express <laughs> your frustrations. Um, but they wouldn't be proper to show here. So uh, even though traffic shows up first, you might imagine that some other words will also uh, be very popular in these postings. Um, so here, the, 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 why is that, again, why does that matter? Uh, why does that matter to the, the public sector? Um, you know, people today are thinking about you could rate the post office on how well they perform. In fact, at Berkeley, uh, as professors, we are rated by our students, and it does affect our paycheck. Um, when I was in France, and it's a different culture, and it was the 80s, um, 90s, uh, we would also rate our professors, but uh, at least among the student population, we suspected that most of the ratings went straight to the trash. Now, I don't know this for a fact. Um, <laughs> so now there is progress because people are thinking, well, we could actually rate our public uh, the, we could rate the infrastructure of the public service. So if you think about rating a highway, people would vote, you know, it's like 280 is a really good highway because it really clogs at this time, and 101 is maybe a bad highway because it clogs more at that time. Um, this, in a sense, might represent the instantiation of that paradigm where people give ratings um, to the infrastructure, and social networks like Waze might be one of the first instantiations of where this is happening, but not yet used by the public service. Um, and we'll come back to that again when we start to think about you know, who, who should own that data and how should that data be used by the public sector. So people proposed a lot of solutions to make this all work together. Um, for example, um, you know, we're going to have systems where the public sector receives data from the private sector and you know, show you these phenomenal diagrams explaining that's the solution. So I really like uh, European painting and usually uh, the painting I like to show to represent that picture is this. You probably all know uh, the Tower of Babel and, and if you... Um, uh, know your biblical reference, basically, uh, by creating a lot of different languages, then um, this tower was, uh, or God made sure that this tower would uh, never be completed because people couldn't speak the same language anymore and then they all fell apart. So it's a very good metaphor of um, 
you know, what's happening today. I mean, you basically have a lot of different data sources and they're in different formats and they have different ownership requirements um, and they have a lot of different intended uses um, and nobody speaks the same language when it comes to systems. Uh, so I think one can fairly say today that in transportation, uh, we're truthfully at the infancy of uh, the potential efficiency that could be gained and used that could be made of this data, mostly because of the battle tower problem. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that, tower, that battle tower problem um, can be solved and some, I would say, baby steps, uh, kindergarten steps that uh, um, um, have been made uh, towards that direction and we're pretty far from uh, being um, there yet. So first I wanna show a vintage website um, and what probably nobody remembers this anymore. No, everybody takes this for granted. The fact that you, know, you turn on your phone and you have uh, traffic data everywhere, including on university as outside of this building. Um, and of course, the story of this, which really the flip point was in 2008, uh, the flip point was that between this, which was the state of the art in 2008, and this, which is something that people don't even question anymore, if you have a smartphone and it doesn't have this on, you need to change smartphone because you probably are using uh, some antique device that cannot support Google Maps and Apple Maps and so on. Um, but the truth is, you know, this system that feeds this um, has been around for uh, probably 40, 50 years. Um, and that's a paradigm of dedicated infrastructure. Um, and then what you see in traffic uh, information systems, not traffic management systems, is this, which is mostly due to cloud source data. All this data that, that comes in the arterial network, that's mostly smartphone generated data um, that uh, is gathered from your phones, whether you know it or not, and whether you want it or not, because you don't have a choice anymore. Um, it's gonna gather it whether you like it or not, uh, unless you're in airplane mode all the time, which won't be very helpful if you <laughs> use the phone, uh, except if you wanna play video games. So, um, and this is an example of what that data looks like. So for example, when we created a system called the Mobile Millennium System, which was um, the early instantiation of this quad sourcing paradigm, it was deployed in 2008 as the first uh, application deployed in North America on RIN and Symbian phones uh, that was gathering GPS information for uh, traffic. It was way before uh, the Android and it was uh, sometime before the iPhone even had a GPS. If you remember the iPhone one uh, did not have a GPS. Um, that's the type of data that, uh, that, that you're getting. And, and that was just uh, half a percent of the data we were getting at the time. This one was a particular feed we were gathering from taxis. Um, and we were also gathering a lot of data from different sources. And it's pretty amazing the um, amount of information you can gather from this. Um, I think to say, today it's fair to say that uh, the amount of data that companies like uh, Google and Apple and, and Microsoft and many others are gathering is, is in the thousands, if 10,000 times more than this. Um, and given the cell phone ownership and the correlation between cell phone ownership and driving in the US, you can pretty much assume that every person in a vehicle today or, or more or less has a cell phone and that that data is being collected by someone. So whether that someone is Google, Apple, or any of the major companies that's that uh, um, provide the OS or the, the applications running on it. Um, so this data is available here. Uh, and this data practically, if you look at the uh, face value of the numbers, would enable the DOTs to manage their traffic properly because if I go back to this initial picture, we're now at the stage where not only you can get speed and travel times on the major arterial network, but the penetration of cell phone in among the population, at least in the US and in many countries in the world, is enough that you could also reconstruct flows. That means number of people, and that's a very important distinction uh, because you can do traffic management if you can count cars, but you cannot, it's very much harder to do if you only have velocities or travel times, which is what traffic information providers have been providing up to now. But again, we're, now we're at a second tilting point where these um, companies uh, have probably enough penetration in the uh, population that they can also reconstruct flows. But it, of course, if you're the government, um, you cannot ac access that data. So if I was working for the Department of Transportation, I would love to have access to that data and I cannot. Um, so, and there's many reasons for it. Um, the, uh, commonly reason, the commonly given reason for this is a privacy. You can try it on the next speaker. Um, she's from Google, I believe. Um, and, uh, and that's a fairly valid reason, but there's a lot of other reasons, of course, with uh, commercial interests and, and so on. Um, so then the question becomes, okay, if the major players in this field um, cannot or don't want to share their data for good reasons uh, with the public sector, um, well, how can the public sector still benefit from that data and what would be the right way to do it? 
Um, so going back to um, uh, this, um, when we started that study, the first step of the study was just to demonstrate you could write such an app. And I really love to show this form because it's really vintage and it's a good old times when um, you, you know, it was uh, pretty easy to do things. Now it's a, a multi-platform and it's a bit harder. Um, but that very first instantiation of a traffic app that was launched from Berkeley enabled us to actually acquire a lot of expertise in this field, which is now used by the public sector to buy this data. And I'm going to explain how. So let me give two examples of what that means. When you buy uh, or when you use crowdsource data, um, there's a lot of problems with it that this crowd is very familiar with. I'm gonna give two, for example, one on reliability and one on privacy. So this is an example of a taxi in San Francisco that is sampled every 30 seconds. So red dot means uh, GPS location. So if I ask my six years old daughter, Miriam, to um, draw a line uh, between this point and to tell me the route of the taxi, okay, she'll do it no problem and she'll draw you the red line and most of the people in this room would do the same. And if you ask a very standard uh, learning algorithm to do the same thing, you're gonna end up with very surprising results. Like for example, the taxi actually goes here. That's because of a map matching problem. This point happens to be actually closer to that street. So the algorithm has no automated way to detect that, well, it's a GPS error. It's not that it's projected on that street. Or even more absurd things like um, if you're stuck at a traffic light and you have subsequent GPS points, so the GPS point later could be behind just because of noise. So an algorithm would practically assume that you're going around the block, which if you're a normal person, you probably are not doing. So, um, okay, so that gives you a sense of, it's like really scratching the surface of the type of difficulties that we have to deal with when we deal with that data. Another problem is privacy. So if you had 2% of traffic, which is what we used to have in our old experiments, um, the notion is you could already reconstruct travel times. And as I said, companies like Google and, and Apple, if you just look at the number of smartphones on the market today, have way above that. So this is phenomenal. This is the traffic paradise, or this is the paradise of a traffic engineer. Remember, this is a geek's world here. So um, that's what paradise looks like. Um, you have uh, basically um, uh, time here, and you have a post mile, and you can pretty much track every vehicle every three seconds. And with 2% of the vehicles, um, you can track every trajectory and then see the, the location in the traffic jam. That data is available. It's collected locally. A lot of it is transmitted in the back end, and depending on the company you talk to, um, I mean, they won't give you official numbers, but you can pretty much guess the frequency at, and the lengths for which it's gathered, and that's common practice, I would say, in the private sector. Um, there are other ways that have been invented to prevent that from happening. One way being the notion of a virtual trip line, which is, in a sense, a geomarker. The idea being that, you know, if you didn't want to disclose your trajectory all the time, but yet wanted to provide useful information to um, other people, like the private sector, like the public sector, um, you could do it in a way where, embedded with a map, geographical markers would trigger probabilistic updates of sending data. So, you know, I'm a phone, and once in a while, based on some probabilistic algorithm, I do send some data when I cross a geographic marker, which stays local to the map, and uh, therefore makes it much harder to track you. So this scratches the surface to what it means to try to create architectures that can support more privacy in that process. Now you might argue that, you know, based on what uh, 13 years old uh, um, uh, teenagers post on Facebook, privacy is a lost cause. I mean, who would care about giving away their location data given what they post on Facebook? That's a different um, a conversation. But here, what that would mean in terms of um, data is that suddenly, instead of working with this, you're working with this. So now the job of a traffic engineer becomes much harder because what you have to do is you have to be able to reconstruct the important features that a public agency might need, such as uh, location of the traffic jams, from uh, that data, which is now sampled probabilistically and also at a much lower resolution. This is what you would get by using some standard statistical filtering techniques like ensemble Kaman filtering on simple hyperbolic first order flow models, which are standard models used um, in the field. And you know the results are pretty comparable to what you, the ground truth would say. Um, and so these are interesting alternatives that have been investigated uh, in the past by several companies to kind of provide a privacy-friendly environment, in a sense, to uh, their users. Um, this this 
specific paradigm is called the virtual trip line. It was actually a, a joint project between Berkeley and Nokia, and it was patented in uh, 2007 or 2008, if I remember correctly. Okay, so lots of work to do in filtering, lots of work to do on privacy. Now, how do we help public agencies to, to use that data? Uh, at Berkeley, we're a um, public university. One of our missions is to help um, our sister agency, the California Department of Transportation, or more generally, the state of California, um, uh, in their missions, uh, for example, traffic operations. Now, you have to realize that you know, this data in traffic timescales is still very recent. Uh, loop detector data has been around for the last 40 years. Uh, GPS data at the level we have it today is only a couple years old. So there is no paradigm for public agencies today to buy this in a standard manner. You know, um, buying a bridge or getting a bridge constructed is something very standard. There's 22,000 bridges in California. So even a 12.4 billion bridge like the Bay Bridge is a procedure that is pretty standard uh, to do. But buying GPS data is not obvious. You buy it by the kilo or by the pound. And then uh, what does it mean to get a pound of uh, um, you know, rotten GPS data? What does it mean for GPS data to be rotten? So th these concepts are not clear. Like if you ask an inspector to inspect a bridge structurally, they can tell you, change the bolts because the bolts are rotten. Or redo that structure because it's not structurally sound. But what does it mean for the uh, rating agency to go to the DOT and say, well, uh, you know, this GPS data gets an A plus because of this. We, we don't have these metrics at the present time. Or I would say, up to a couple of years ago, these metrics didn't exist in the, pub in the public sector. And that's where we came in, because we're neutral. We're a university with public mission statement and unbiased, therefore um, can help other public agencies define these metrics and standards. And for all the members of the IEEE here, um, I mean, you know that the IEEE has established a lot of standards, for example, in radio. You could view this as a, as a similar standard. There is no standard yet to buy GPS data. And unless that standard is clearly established, it's hard to create a market. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, um, more and more often nowadays, public agencies come and want to procure that data. So there needs to be a market study, like who is going to sell that data. We already know who is not going to sell the data, so the difficulty is to find who is going to sell the data. Uh, how to write an RFP, how to write a contract, how to monitor a contract, and potentially how to uh, make sure that the quality of the deliverables is conformed to what the agency is expecting. So it was a bit of a historical thing when in 2011, uh, the first procurement of GPS data ever done in California was put together in Berkeley, um, the Institute of Transportation Studies, and my group specifically was in charge of doing this. And it was quite a, it, exciting because the California Department of Transportation asked us to basically put together all the procedures that we would used to do, like, you know, we bid on contracts all the time at National Science Foundation and whatnot. Well, this time we were in charge of putting the whole process together because it had never been done. So the, all the things I was talking about before became very handy because having been um, the conceivers of one of the first of such apps and then the user of that data, we were in a really good position to try to help them define the standards that would matter for them. Um, and what are these standards? So I was asking you, you, know, you buy it by the pound or by the kilo, and what does it mean to be like good quality GPS data? You base it on the smell or on something else? Well, so first, what does it mean to have useful GPS data, say for traffic operations, which is very different from planning or other applications? Well, good GPS data should definitely be less than five minutes old, because otherwise it's obsolete. I'm very excited to know the traffic uh, when I'm going to hit the road to go home, but I don't care to know what it was two hours ago because it's completely irrelevant for me. So what that means is that already in establishing a procedure for public sectors, agencies to actually buy this data, you want to make sure you have a threshold. So for example, uh, defining that you know, any data less than or more than five minutes old is going to be rated very poorly because it might be very helpful for planners, fine, but for traffic operations, it's useless. This is an example of uh, one specific feed of GPS data um, that doesn't really satisfy this criterion. In this tool, you see the amount of seconds required between the measurement, which you can get because the GPS is timestamped, and the time it's received by the server. And it kind of hovers over uh, five minutes quite frequently. So this is an example of a criterion that a public agency might really want to know because that, is, that feed would be 
probably excellent for planning, but not very good for operations. Now, people might come and say, hey, no problem. I'm going to sell you 1 million GPS points a day. Great. So that kind of looks good because it's a large number, say it's for a city like San Francisco. But then if you look at the time history of this, you might find that, oh, there's phenomenal amounts of data at night and none during the day. So you scratch your head, why is that? Oh, okay, it's data coming from trucking. And well, the trucking companies mostly are on the road at night. So that data is also not very helpful for operations because you're mostly interested in helping um, figuring out traffic jams and that's the time when you have no information. So that's another example to show that the volume of data is in general not a good indicator of whether that's a good source of data. And then you need to dig deeper. For example, um, if you plot these um, uh, time space diagrams, which every square indicating where in space you have more data, um, then you might find out that some strange sources of data have phenomenal amounts of data, but it's always where there's no traffic. So you figure out why. And then you start to think and you figure out, oh, these are fleets like FedEx or UPS or USPS or whatnot. And what these fleets do is because of their phenomenal logistics, they always stay out of the freeway at peak hour. So they usually travel really early or off peak. And then during rush hour, they do the deliveries because then they can navigate in a residential area and avoid the traffic. So there, again, not very useful data because in general, you're really interested in figuring out the traffic patterns on the freeway when it hurts. That means at uh, uh, congested time. All right, and I, you can go on and on and on. I mean, traffic is a very conversational field and everybody has a story to tell, but these things need to be rationalized and these things need to be put in some way that you can create a rating system. And so this first procurement that was put together for the state of California in 2011 was an example like this, where uh, in order to be able to rate the data, we had to put together guidelines uh, that were clear, that were transparent, and made sense obviously to the bidders, but also was aligned with operational objectives of the um, uh, public agencies. And so a um, couple other graphs to show that. Um, so the grand question now is, okay, you have all these data sources which are fairly diverse, um, and uh, these include fixed sensors and fleets, like I was saying, travel mostly at night, taxis, who have very specific patterns, cell phones and, uh, and PNDs and so on. And so from a public agency's perspective, you'd like to actually buy that data uh, in a way that you don't have to um, create your own traffic monitoring system because you cannot afford it, particularly in California, which has gone through very severe years in the last past couple of years. And the complicated question is like, if these are private sector companies and at the end the customer is the public sector, um, well, who owns the data and where is the data processed? So somehow the creation of a pipeline uh, that does this is still a not completely solved problem. So in the case of the initial um, procurement that was done in 11, we had a lot of bidders. Um, it was really nice because then it also established a market price. Um, but one can fairly say that, you know, that market today still doesn't exist. I mean, it was an experimental market. That procurement was done. It was a real success. It was used in practice. Um, but that market still needs to emerge. And then the question of who are going to be the sellers is quite interesting. There's a lot of startup companies that have a lot of that data. And the notion of selling that data uh, might be very attractive to some and less to others for reasons that have to do with uh, strategic and commercial interest um, and uh, uh, business plan. And so that's something that still needs to be solved because we're very far from having a complete set of data that the private sector, that the public sector could use for um, management of traffic. So getting closer to the end here, um, I want to talk about a few other things, talking about the future. This middle column here represents roughly anything from the 1960s to the 1990s. It's uh, you know, putting things in the pavement, uh, putting cameras on buildings, uh, putting uh, radars that, that does this. This is like a fixed sensor paradigm from the past that is only used when there is money and that certainly is not enough to instrument the whole uh, sector. The, this right column here, shows the paradigm of the early 2000 to maybe now, where you start to be nomadic and, and, and crowdsource all this data from everywhere. Um, what's interesting is that now, um, you know, with satellites and with UAVs, you can start to even uh, do the same thing. And you know, we're, we're not to the point where we're gonna fly UAVs to monitor traffic, though that has been done. If you remember the traffic news uh, in the 90s, there was a guy flying on the helicopter telling you about the traffic. So that has been done in the past, but I mean, the notion that you would have UAVs doing this is not completely crazy in the sense that um, 
we'll have a lot more UAVs flying over urban areas. They're already talking about pizza delivery by UAV or, or Amazon delivery by UAV. So you could have alternate ways of monitoring traffic this way. But also you hear a lot these days, and you can ask to other speakers today about uh, big companies buying satellite companies, okay? Um, and uh, figuring out how um, iPhones are shipped out of a factory in China and then go to the Amazon warehouse and when the Amazon trucks leave to know exactly what competitors are doing. So obviously now this is, uh, I would say this is not passe because there's still phenomenal amounts of work to do here, but we're entering a phase where that monitoring might even be done by Big Brother in person um, and would really provide much better traffic results and many other added benefits for three letters agencies, but that's a different workshop. Um, so, uh, you know, starting with an F or a C or whatever you want. Um, so, uh, how does that help the public sector? You know, in the past, it's all been about ramp metering and changeable message signs and special use lanes. Um, and then at the beginning of the year 2000 and apps like old Nokia apps, uh, and now Google and Apple and Microsoft and so on. Um, and then the transit agencies getting involved. The traffic management systems, and I wanna change this to mobility management systems of the future, will be built in a way that, you know, the public sector has to drive this because they're in charge of the cities. The mayors, the counties, um, the cities, uh, the California Department of Transportation and many others they, they're, they're in charge of that mobility, and they have the grand plan, and they have the staff and the competence to, to understand how that works. Um, but the vectors are not necessarily gonna be in the public sector. Think about Waze, about Google, about Apple Maps. They're probably way more influential in telling you what to do than the public websites, for a reason, because they're driven by market. So somehow that happy marriage needs to happen, and what that means is that, you know, if everybody follow one particular navigator, and that has happened many times in the past, that in itself can already create a traffic jam because one, one traffic provider, uh, unnamed company, and there's many of them who have done that already, uh, routes everybody through the same place. So they create a, a, a traffic jam that would not have existed in the first place if people had not used that tool. That's a, a, a commonly known problem in economics. Um, so that shows that you know, if you just leave it to companies, it doesn't work. If you just leave it to the government, we know it cannot be done because it, they don't have the financial means for it. So that happy marriage has to happen. And it will probably happen with pressure because you can see some cities being already almost asphyxiated and have no more room for traffic and mobility growth. So um, that's where the next effort will be and that's where Berkeley is helping a lot the public sector to, to do. So you're looking now at a system where you have some connected corridor system which talks to the transit agencies, which talks to the people who have sensing data, obviously to the industry that manufactures um, uh, apps that are used by commuters and the public agencies because they are going to say, you know, um, there is a football match and that's going to create an extra 70,000 trip in this area. Uh, they're going to change the traffic lights accordingly. If you don't, your navigator doesn't know it, it's going to route you straight through the congestion because it doesn't know it. So there is benefit from the private sector angle too. With that added information, they can provide better guidance. And if they do it well, they can also help the efficiency of the system. And there's a whole flow chart that can support that in which basically you can, do, you need to figure out what's happening now, you need to predict what's gonna happen later, you need to actually know how to respond to it, and because we're not yet in uh, Terminator and the Skynet taking over the planet, uh, there still needs to be a human involved in confirming that what the machine thinks is correct and actually pushing the button. And maybe in the 21st or 22nd century we'll talk about Skynet, but I think right now, um, with our infrastructure, it's nice to have humans involved. Um, I talked about uh, this before, so just to talk uh, one more slide about our mission in Los Angeles and then finishing with a little bit of a security to give a little bit of a scare too because I think it's nice that um, you know uh, you don't think that everything is, is flowing well. So one of the examples uh, th that keeps people sharp and thinking. Um, so um, th this is an example of a test bed we're, which we're starting uh, next year and then we'll have two years to complete it um, to help the California Department of Transportation manage their corridors. In the past, in the United States and in many other uh, parts in the world, um, you know, departments of transportation have dealt with their freeways and uh, cities have dealt with their traffic and pretty much with conflicting objectives. Like the highways wanted to put metering lights to prevent people entering the freeway too hard rapidly so it can keep flowing um, or diverting traffic. And then you had some mayors and some cities in, in the United States being elected with the slogan, we will put the cars back on the freeway where they belong, you know. 
So now you have a mayor trying to push the cars onto the freeway, and then you have a DOT trying to push the cars out of the freeway, and you can imagine how much efficiency will result from such good collaboration. <laughs> so the notion that you're going to operate a corridor in an integrated manner, even though that's surprising, is a relatively new concept. And one of the missions we have to deliver to Los Angeles by 2000. Uh, 17 is to provide such a decision support system that can support that. Saying like, when there is an accident, the California Highway Patrol will use the on-ramps to get people off the freeway. I've seen this happen when there are accidents. Um, so basically, you put a policeman on the freeway, they stop it, and then you use the on-ramp to just leave the freeway. That can create catastrophes if you don't put the cities in the loop. But if you put the cities in the loop, now you can create a complete diversion path that can only work if you you know, e each of these traffic lights represented by the red dot here needs to be able to accommodate that extra flow. So there is a coordination there. And you can see now the, where everything fits together, the crowdsource data, the infrastructure, the public working with the private sector. And that's really the holy grail of making this whole system work better. And before I let you go, I also want to share you with the scary part. Because, you know, it, it, it all is nice and we have plans for a grand future, but this also poses a lot of challenges in terms of vulnerability. Um, <laughs> If you think about a physical process like traffic, there's sensing involved. That's you giving your data willingly or not to whoever is collecting it. Um, there is regulation. That's basically um, the public agencies trying to regulate by traffic lights and so on. And then there's reaction. So it's like you reacting to what's happening. If that traffic light never turns red when you like it, you're going to choose another route. Well, each of them are, have vulnerabilities. So you probably all saw this movie, The Italian Job. Um, I love this movie. Uh, this, you will never shut down the real Napster. And this guy actually kind of diverting traffic in LA so they can steal gold. That software actually exists. It's a real software of D7 uh, in Los Angeles. Um, now, this actually has been done for real. Um, in fact, uh, this picture kind of looks like out of a movie. But these are the two guys from LA who did it. And this is uh, them and their wives outside of the court. I think they got three years. Um, for, for basically doing what's in the movie uh, for a very different purpose. Uh, so bottom line is uh, tampering with the regulation happens. That's one of the difficulties of dealing with that technology. Another one is like you probably have seen these signs like zombies crossing the road. And then, yeah. So actually this is a, typically a hacker that's going to try to put a, uh, um, a funny sign. So here the guy is like hacked by and then he puts an idea of the hacker. That happens too. So imagine, you know, if, if you put like a things here that could really disrupt traffic. So that's tampering with the regulation. And that's easy to do. You could do it the French way, where you actually uh, tamper with a system that's called a snail operation. Send people uh, going 20 miles an hour on the freeway, all in line, and that um, limits the throughput of the freeway. That's a national sport in my country. Which is, like if you want to protest for something, um, it's fairly common. You do it with tractors, it's really nice because the tractor has a cruise speed of about 20 miles an hour. So even if you push it, you know, you cannot uh, make it faster. And of course, you can spoof the sensing. There's this phenomenal work done in Israel where they actually took ways and they spoofed it. And the way they spoofed it is they created 100 um, uh, fake user accounts. Um, and then they created a traffic jam in the middle of the desert. They called Waze 2 to tell them. But basically, they created fake positions of 100 people in the middle of a road of the desert. And then they were very happy because the Waze traffic was showing a traffic jam um, <laughs> in a place where there's no traffic. Um, so, and by the way, every app has this vulnerability. So it's not that Waze is particularly bad. It just happened that because Waze is so good, when it became uh, famous that it did this, then it, it made all the news. But that's another example how you can spoof the sensing. I'll give one more example. Uh, because I think uh, that I'm almost out of time and this will give you the level of sophistication. Now, what people like to do is also to do it in a fancy manner. So this is not science fiction. Some guy managed to actually fly, this is the guy, um, he managed to actually fly a UAV over a traffic light and by spoofing the Wi-Fi, managed to switch the, um, uh, 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 managed to show that you could switch the timing plan of the traffic light. So if you spoof the sensor, the sensor thinks there's more flow or less flow, and then the traffic light will change directly. So now you're to the point where you could even, you know, if, I don't know if you saw the last James Bond where this uh, new uh, Q guy says that uh, he could create a lot of damage by uh, being in his pajamas before his first cup of all gray. So now you don't really need to actually go to the site. You just send a UAV to spoof the thing, and it will do some damage for you. So I kind of try to paint a nice picture of the future by showing that you know, with this data, you could do a lot more. But with this data, there's a lot of interesting questions that come uh, together, like security. And that's one of the things that uh, we'll work on over the next decade, because there is probably a lot of work for a decade. 
So I'm going to stop here. This is my last slide. I want to thank Anno again for the opportunity to speak. And um, if there is time, which I'm not sure, because uh, the French trains was still on time by three minutes, um, then I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yeah, the problem of the pricing of lane, HOV lanes, and HOT lanes is a fairly complex problem uh, because, first, there is even debate today at Berkeley, there's already the two opinions so are completely 100% uh, different, that it's not clear that increasing or decreasing the throughput on the HOV lane or HOT lane is good for traffic. But that aside, if you think that it's good, then the real question is, okay, should you price it, and should you price it based on uh, destination? Yes, maybe that works because it could relieve traffic, but then you have a lot of problems of economic fairness. Um, and so most of the issues to do with pricing uh, today and the difficulty of people to understand how they should price it uh, are usually slowed down by, e by equity issues. Um, and so that's something that really needs to be addressed. There's a very interesting experiment in Singapore with the ERP2 system where they are actually going to go beyond that, where they not only price you by the lanes you use, by actually the actual path you use by using GPS. Um, the economics of this is still very much unresolved and there's a lot of debate on it. Okay, yeah. I did not understand that like heat map you were showing, showing earlier. Okay. With the um, with with the where you where you like did the random sampling, but before that you had like the full resolution, and then you had the smaller resolution, and it seemed like a very important map. So if you could explain it a bit. Sure, more sure, sure. This is the paradise of traffic engineers. So <laughs> I should really explain that. Um, this map. Yes. Yeah. This is a time space diagram of. Um, vehicle position. So if you take a point here, it means at 11.23, it's at post mile 23 or 24 post mile. On, the, on the freeway. And then the color of the point indicates the speed. So blue means uh, roughly 60, 70 miles an hour, oh. and then red <laughs> means uh, 30, 20 miles an hour. So th um, the time space resolution of this graph shows you what you can collect if 2% of you guys are sending a data point every three seconds. Roughly every three seconds, you can follow what the person, uh, sorry, roughly every three seconds, you can follow what the, the person is doing, and then you have the corresponding granularity along the, along the line. That's if you keep tracking people. It's like you're leaving a constant breadcrumb behind you. And then the next slide uh, was how you would do um, if you didn't do this. So I was not tracking you from here to here. It's like if you're here, maybe you send me some point. No point, no point, maybe a point again. Can I still reconstruct the traffic flow based on that information? Does that answer the question? Yeah, how do you, how do you, so each of these dots, like how do you know that it's one, one, one um, car? Um, well, that, it, well, exactly, that is, the, that, is the, that is the crux of the thing. In the current, in most of the app providers today will keep your ID attached to the points. So if you, uh, unnamed company are doing a lot of apps, um, will know that this is your location and that will be attached to your name to your cell phone number, to your Gmail account or Apple mail account or whoever mail account, and to any of the other apps information linked to that. So currently that information is all linked by many of the providers. And that's completely fine. That's the state of, of the art. So the notion of moving from a paradigm like this to a paradigm where um, you wouldn't even need it to know it's the same person. So here's like, I see a car here, I see a car here, but I really don't care whether that's the same because for traffic it doesn't really matter. Obviously it provides a lot more privacy uh, than, than the first one. And, and I, I was just showing this as an illustration of the fact um, that, uh, you know, if you want to provide specific information like traffic, you don't need to track people all the time. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I mean, again, it's not an opinion. I'm just saying uh, scientifically, you don't need to. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you.